Hi, I'm Frank Diamond, the managing editor of Infection Control Today. We're helping infection preventionists and others on the front lines battling COVID-19. With me today is Dr. Kevin Cavanaugh. Dr. Cavanaugh is a member of our editorial advisory board, and he has written extensively for us about COVID-19, usually finding the stories and trends that others miss. Thanks for being with us today, Dr. Cavanaugh. Well, thank you very much, Frank. Now, what recent developments about the, this crisis are you keeping an eye on these days, Doctor? I know you've been all over this and, and been following it very closely. What are you looking at these days? Well, right now, I'm very concerned and interested in the public acceptance of guidance on how not to become infected. And I think with our opening up of the economy, that's of paramount importance. Now, um, as you know, one of uh, the interview, a expert I interviewed said that cloth masks are basically useless against uh, COVID-19. Uh, you don't quite agree with that or, or, or you have some caveats? Well, it depends on the context of the usage. For the healthcare worker or the infection preventionist that wants to themselves prevent themselves from getting COVID-19, a cloth mask offers little protection. Right. You definitely would need an N95 mask. You would need goggles, gowns, and full gear. And this is what is of paramount importance to protect our healthcare workers. Mm -hmm. But when you talk about the public, the concern here we have is of asymptomatic carriers transmitting this virus to other people. And in this context, cloth masks may be very beneficial. It is known that up to 50% of the general population that has COVID-19 are asymptomatic carriers and that they may not know they're carrying the virus and they can spread it to others. And research indicates that cloth masks are effective in preventing that spread. So it doesn't protect the wearer of the mask as much as it protects other people. Yeah, but you're aware that not everybody agrees, you, agrees with you on that one, though, right? Well, yes, but there have been a number of articles which have come out recently, which does point to the necessity of the public wearing masks. Uh, for example, when you look at the spread of a cough or a sneeze, new articles, one which came out in JAMA Network, uh, indicates that a sneeze can spread droplets 23 to 27 feet. A cough can spread uh, droplets up to nine feet. And this was uh, from researchers out of the Florida Atlantic University. And they can linger in the air for 30 to 40 seconds. And so it is of paramount importance that we try to cut down on the spread. And that type of spread will not be stopped by just social distancing of six feet. Loud speech is another uh, problem. This can aerosolize particles uh, for eight to 14 minutes. And research has shown that those particles can actually live in the air for up to three hours. Mm -hmm. So that cloth masks then become important in trying to prevent the person that's projecting these particles. That's kind of like a directional spread of those viruses directly into the mask. It will cut down on the spread. There have been some research that have indicated that under certain conditions that that spread could be cut down up to 90%. And there's been some recent modeling which has shown that if the public wears masks, let's say 80% of the public wears masks, that that in itself could help burn out this epidemic. And of course, as, infection, as an infection preventionist uh, are exposed to more and more patients, their chances of getting infected become greater and greater. So it is a very good tactic to try to prevent infections in healthcare workers by just preventing the infections in the first place. In other words, becoming active with educating the public on how not to acquire this virus. When we, when we talk about cloth masks, I know there are people who make cloth masks, and people make their own cloth masks. If I go there and I, I get one of my old t-shirts and I rip it and I just kind of wear it over my, tie it over myself like it's a bandana of some sort. 
It, does that count as a cloth mask or is that just? Not? Well, that would count, but that would probably be a very low level cloth mask. You'd want to have it several plies thick. And of course, the type of material will make a difference. Mm -hmm. But the CDC does have guidance on how to make these. So does John Hopkins. And if you go to the COVID-19 pages on the healthwatchusa.org website, we have a little video of someone making a, uh, a cloth mask along with uh, some of the templates, both from CDC and John Hopkins. So that these are things that can be done. You can also buy them online. They usually cost around $5. So this will not, though, protect the person wearing the mask. Don't think if you wear it, you don't have to social distance. Because when you breathe in, the air flows differently. It will come in along the sides and, and the corners, and that lower uh, flow rate will permeate the mask a bit also. So it won't provide much protection to you, let alone you can still get the virus in your eyes and on the rest of your uh, clothing, which uh, can, you can get contaminated when you try to take them off. It's the old problem in, you know, in infection control. It's not just wearing the inf infection control gear, it's the downing and doffing of the uh, equipment. It's very important to uh, get right. So masks probably are not going to affect the wearer when they're the general public but they do help spread the virus if that wearer isn't a hip, I'm sorry, they will help prevent spread of the virus if the wearer is an asymptomatic carrier of the virus. So if I'm an infection preventionist or, or a nurse or a doctor or an emergency room uh, personnel, uh, I, I'd rather see someone come in with a mask than without a mask, obviously, even if it's a cloth mask. Uh, that's correct. And all patients, I think, whether they have COVID-19 or not, because again, with the asymptomatic carriage rate, you will not know whether or not they have it until you get a test. So all patients coming into a facility should be given a mask, at least a surgical mask. If you don't have those, use a cloth mask. Because again, there the idea isn't so much to protect the patient, although in a healthcare facility, you'd like to protect the patient too but it's to prevent an asymptomatic carrier from spreading it to others. And in order to get any sort of protection through the mouth and nose of the wearer, you would need an N95 mask. Um, I, I wasn't going to ask you about this. We actually haven't talked about this before, but um, you've mentioned Johns Hopkins many, uh, several times, and uh, we have, do have a member, one of the members of our editorial advisory board it does work for Johns Hopkins, but He's so busy these days, he can't talk to us or anybody else much. Um, how is it that Johns Hopkins has land, landed so in the middle of this? Uh, they're the ones that everybody's looking for for data. They're the ones that seem to be really have a, their finger on the pulse. Do you know any idea why Johns Hopkins and of all the hospitals and the institutions of in the country is so much a part of this? Well, they do have a very famous uh, public health a system and public health arm of the university so that I think that's important. But they've also, you know, have stepped in to fill a void when there was a void of tracking this data. And my understanding is they use a number of different sources, including health departments, Worldometer, et cetera, to comprise their data. And then they have a very good interactive display of world data and of data in the United States. So I think that's kind of what happened. And certainly that's the data that I think is good to use. We also use the Worldometer data. Mm -hmm. uh, Worldometer is a nonprofit site that provides population data and world tracking data to uh, the National Libraries of uh, Medicine, or I'm sorry, National Libraries of uh, the United States. And, and they're a well-respected uh, institution. As you mentioned earlier, we're, we're, many states are on their way to reopening. Uh, what worries you most about reopening uh, at, at the moment? Well, what worries me the most is that people are going to say, oh, it's over with and not do any sort of protection, whether it's social distancing, wearing masks, not gathering in crowds. I really think that people think, well, we got this beat, so we're going to go out and have a good time over Memorial Day weekend. And I think that is the most dangerous thing. Uh, it also worries me about states that are completely re reopening because some of the areas that are reopening, I think, still pose dangers and that's such as 
uh, gyms, uh, tattoo uh, salons, restaurants is also a problem when, when it's indoor dining. All of these types of services, I think we're still in the infancy of knowing how to stop the spread in them. I think they're higher risk than activities that you can do outdoors or when you're sure you can have a very long uh, distance between you and the other person. And so that is kind of my caveats. Uh, for me, I still like to do takeout or pickup types of dining. Or, and if I was going to dine at the restaurant, I would want to be doing social distancing outside with a dining table and having my food preparers and the servers wearing masks. And, but that's still going to be higher risk than pick up or having it, having it delivered at home. What role do you think uh, infection preventionists and uh, others of our readers who include hospital administrators and environmental services people, um, procurement teams, sterile uh, disinfection teams, um, are, there, are their roles going to change now after COVID-19 and can you fathom, fathom how how will change in, in, in any way? Well, I think that they're going to be more involved also with community education. I think that they'll be put more to the forefront of infection prevention. As we've discussed before, there are a number of recommendations for COVID-19 that you have to scratch your head and say, well, why aren't we doing this for all dangerous pathogens? Mm -hmm. And so I think it's going to place them more at the forefront of really a resource and expertise which is invaluable to the hospital facility. And I think that you'll see infection prevention is starting to appear in nursing homes and being an integral part of that type of facility where all too often they were all but absent. Do you think this will happen uh, by nursing homes just choosing to do that on their own or do you think that maybe the CDC will, will start uh, saying mandating it? Well, right now, CMS is mandating that uh, the nursing home should have an infection preventionist that is able to handle the work there and be able to adequately prevent outbreaks. In other words, you have to have an infection uh, preventionist that is adequate for the you know, needs of the facility, as opposed to the old definition, which was just part-time, which my interpretation could be one hour per year, which couldn't eat, you know, couldn't begin to meet the needs of the facility. So we may see some increase in infection preventionists input into nursing home care, and that is vitally needed. Um, I'm going to ask you to look into your crystal ball. What do you see um, Memorial Day weekend in the year 2021? 2021, I hope that we are out uh, playing uh, beach ball, golf, having picnics and not having much of any restrictions. And that's provided that we get a vaccine out to the general population. And I'm very hopeful with some of the initial steps that are being taken to hurry up the process. And this doesn't mean they're cutting corners, but they're starting to manufacture vaccines before they even know if they work so that they can be used if in case they do become medi medically efficacious and they're also talking about using challenge trials, which could cut the process of seeing whether or not that vaccine works down to weeks, as opposed to many months or even a year. So those are very hopeful. And we should also remember, we have over 100 companies working on this vaccine. So there's a, a lot of shots that are gonna be taken on court. And one of them I'm very hopeful will hit and that we'll be able to gear up quite rapidly for distribution and that we can determine the efficacy of the vaccine very quickly. So that's what I'm hoping for. I hope a year from now, and, and this may be over optimistic, but a year from now, I hope that we'll start to have a vaccinated population with a safe and effective vaccine. Dr. Kevin Cavanaugh, as always, thank you for joining us here at Infection Control today.